Hi everyone, I'm David Rolnick. Welcome to Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning, a workshop at the conference iClear 2020. This is the third day of the workshop, Land Use Day, focused on agriculture, forestry, and other land use. And it's co-organized with a computer vision for agriculture workshop at iClear. So thank you very much to them for helping make this happen. Um, this is a five-day workshop. We had the main workshop day two days ago on Sunday. Then we had an exciting program focused on energy yesterday. Uh, today is agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Tomorrow we have climate science and adaptation to the effects of climate change. And then on April 30th, we will have a day focused on cross-cutting methods in machine learning, like remote sensing, which many of you here today may be interested in as well and focusing really on the methodology behind some of these incredible applications. How to participate today. Well done everyone who is in this Zoom meeting, you are in the right place. This is how you can watch the, the video throughout the day. Uh, you can ask questions either in the Zoom chat uh, associated with this, with this webinar or in the Rocket Chat if you are a registered attendee of the iClear conference. We will be monitoring Rocket Chat as well, but um, many of the questions will be asked in the, in the Zoom chat because not everyone is a registered uh, attendee of iClear. Um, for additional info and relevant links, including the full schedule, you can go to our website, which is climatechange.ai slash uh, iClear 2020 workshop. I want to thank again the organizers of this overall workshop, uh, Priya Donti, uh, Lynn Kak, Sacha Lucioni, Krish Shankaran, Sharon Zhu, Mustafa Assis, uh, Carla Gomes, Andrew Eng, and Joshua Bengio, as well as the, the co-organizers, in particular David Dao, who will be speaking in a moment, um, and our wonderful program committee for helping make this entire five-day workshop happen, as well as our sponsors, Microsoft, and DeepMind. Again, for more info, please check out the website. Um, there is a social media hashtag if you want uh, to be tweeting about this, uh, CCAI iClear20. Um, and for any questions or troubleshooting that you might have, uh, please email us at that email or um, message us on Rocket Chat, again, for, for attendees of the iClear conference. So with that, uh, I'll let David Dao take us through the schedule for today. We might be having connection issues. Do we have David? Uh, I will take us through the schedule for today. Uh, we will be starting out uh, with a fireside chat with Professor Catherine Nakalembe on sustainable agriculture, food security, and climate change. So that will be for the next hour. Then we're going to have a tutorial, uh, especially designed for machine learning practitioners on climate change, the, the various issues involved in climate change mitigation, so reducing the effects of climate change and adaptation, responding to those effects. Uh, and that will be given by Lynn Kak, Chris Shankaran, and uh, Priya Donti. And uh, then we'll have some updates from uh, presenters at previous workshops run by this initiative, Climate Change AI. So we also had workshops at ICML and NeurIPS and AMLD, some other, other machine learning conferences. Uh, over the past year. And so we'll have a couple of updates from Bjorn Lutkens and Benjamin uh, Franchetti and Duccio Piovani um, from those different, the different workshops. Then we're going to have a session on machine learning and agriculture, uh, precision ag, remote sensing, and the soil microbiome. So how machine learning can be used in different ways within agriculture to achieve more sustainable agriculture um, and uh, in, ensure that agriculture is actually a, um, bringing carbon dioxide out of the air instead of putting it back into the air. Um, 
And then we will have a session on machine learning in forests, uh, focused on deforestation, afforestation, and forest management. Uh, and then a panel with those speakers um, from the, the machine learning and forests session. So uh, I hope you're all excited. I'm very excited for our wonderful lineup today. Uh, please, uh, again, message us, let us know if there are any technical issues or, or any, any questions arise. Um, and we look forward to, to all of these exciting events. Uh, now I will try to stop sharing here um, and we can get started with the, with the first session, uh, our fireside chat with Catherine Nakalembe. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us here today. Um, one moment. Uh, so Catherine Nakalembe is an assistant research professor at the University of Maryland. She grew up in Kampala, Uganda, where she earned a bachelor's at Makarere University in environmental science. She earned her master's in geography and environmental engineering from Johns Hopkins University and her PhD in geographical science at the University of Maryland. Nakalembe has broad interests ranging from agriculture remote sensing, food security to climate change. She has worked with the World Bank Environment Group and Climate Change Unit, the Nature Conservancy, Washington Adventist University, the United Nations Development Program, and the NASA LC LUC program. She is currently working with government agencies in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda as a co-investigator on the NASA Servier Applied Sciences Team and NASA Harvest. Nakalembe also serves as the program assistant for the NASA Land Cover and Land Use Change Program. Her doctoral research focused on drought and its impacts on land use and livelihoods in the Karamoja region of northeastern Uganda. Nakalembe pioneered the repurposing of remote sensing by unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, from agricultural monitoring to the survey of major refugee camps in her native Uganda. Uh, please join me in welcoming Catherine Nakalembe. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, David. Thanks for that. Uh... Uh, for that introduction. Sorry, I ran away for a little bit. Um, I don't know if everybody knows this, but I have uh, three old twins and uh, the management can be crazy. So <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for joining us, even e even in the middle of, of these difficult times, uh, having uh, being being a parent. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Maybe you can start out by just uh, talking us through how you end up ended up working in this area. Um, so uh, as you said, I grew up in Kampala. I am actually in Kampala right now. Um, and uh, lockdown happened while I, I just arrived a week um, for my work. I'm currently leading a, a, a NASA severe project on um, using earth observations for agriculture monitoring. So I was uh, at the start of my long, um, basically three week, sometimes three week, four week um, uh, work across the region. Um, I grew up here. I was born in Makindye. Uh, it's a little bit uh, sort of very close to the city center. Um, and I did my undergrad, my high school undergrad, everything in, in Uganda. Um, when I was finishing my high school, I used to play badminton a lot. So we and my sisters, we all were athletes in quotes, but uh, we just played badminton. And uh, when I finished high school, I thought I was going to go to university and do sports science for my undergrad. It was a new program. It seemed really cool and I really wanted to do it. But um, to do that, I would have had to qualify for a government scholarship and I didn't actually qualify for it. And so uh, while I was trying to figure out what, what I was going to do, because I didn't have any other, you know, resources or ways to figure out what to, you know how to get into university I found out that there are these additional programs that are not typically advertised because they're new and one of them was environmental science so um, for my in my high school I sort of majored in math economics and geography I've always loved geography absolutely loved geography um, and when I applied to the environmental science program, I got in and I got the scholarship. And this is how I ended up here, actually. I would probably be like a sports therapist or a, a, a badminton coach or something like that. Um, so I did my undergrad and right when I was finishing it, I'm gonna close my window because there's a, a bit of noise coming from outside. Um, when I was finishing my undergrad, um, I had this, we had this end of program kind of research activity. You would choose what you wanted to do. So. 
uh, given that you know it is in the city, a lot of people were interested in in waste management um, and uh, water resources management type work. But I was actually interested in um, forestry. I was more interested in going outside of the city because I grew up there. I hadn't been, I hadn't seen the country much. And so I interned with the uh, Uganda Wildlife Authority to do, um, um, initially I went uh, to Windy, uh, the impenetrable pack where there are these uh, mountain gorillas. Uh, and they had a clinic there. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't even get to see a gorilla. So that didn't work out uh, because there were some issues with the clinic. And so a week later, I crossed the country, went all the way to the east of the country into Mount Elgon. Uh, to intern with their um, office there and the primary work um, that I was doing was basically going around with the GPS and mapping encroachment into the forest and I'd never actually used the GPS I've never I'd never seen um, uh, but I'd you know done a little bit of GIS in my undergrad and so I really loved like being in the mountain and we hiked for days it was so exhausting it would rain all the time and so right when I was finished my undergrad, I thought, wow, there is just so much more knowledge out there, you know, things that I had no idea existed. So I applied. Um, so I wanted to do a, you know, I wanted to do a master's, but I really wanted to do it a, abroad. And I mean, the reason for me to even think that I would want to do it abroad is uh, my sister at the time was in, uh, in New York. She was doing her, her undergrad. And so she encouraged me. She's like, well, you could apply here. So I, I I applied, I mean, I went to the U.S. Embassy in Kampala and got a lot of advice about, you know, what programs should apply to, how to apply for them, whatever. And so um, I applied, I got into the Johns Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins University into the Masters of Environmental Engineering. And I was really exciting. But, you know, when I was doing it, I didn't get the opportunity to actually, you know, uh, apply that knowledge back home or, you know, really work on problems that were central to what was happening uh, or what I, you know, grew up um, experiencing. And so I was really interested in climate change. And I did, uh, uh, I actually even took an undergraduate class on climate change science, I remember. Specifically, I just signed up extra for it because I thought that maybe, you know, there might be a lot that I would learn from that program. And then I did um, a course on um, environmental policy and my focus was also on climate change policy. And this was so interesting, but then still, it was still far removed from, uh, I think me being able to work back home, it wasn't clear if I'd, you know, stopped at my master's, I'd probably be working primarily primarily maybe for an international agency, but based outside of the country or um, something like that. So when I was, when I finished my, my master's was 29, 2009, during that economic, you know, this is called a downfall, which makes, you know, COVID makes it seem like it was a joke. Um, so I couldn't get a job, I couldn't get an internship. Um, I just, you know, started looking for, for programs to apply to, and I found the program. So the program, uh, when I was writing my personal statement is, uh, I, I just noticed, I, you know, in reading through the profiles of all the faculty at the University of Maryland College Park, it just seemed like the great opportunity for me to bring all this knowledge that I, you know, already have, um, add to its tools, remote sensing, GIS, it had a very strong remote sensing GIS uh, group. Um, and teams, and then apply it back to a problem back home. So they're like these uh, scientists who are leading in, you know, developing, you know, global global products from remote sensing. But then also, there's a lot of field level engagement. So I really, really like that, and that's how I ended up. And so I did my 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 PhD there, and I got to do exactly what I'd hoped for, which is for my focus area, I focused on Uganda, but not where I'd ever expected to actually focus. I ended up working on the Karamoja region, which is the northeast of the country. Uh, I was introduced to doing that through this GeoGlam initiative, which is a global um, GEO is the Group on Earth Observations, and then GLAM is Global Culture Monitoring Initiative. And through that, I was introduced to the GEO um, focal point for Uganda, whose work primarily focused in the Karamoja region. And so, you know, through my PhD advisor, I got a connection to work back home in a region I never imagined I'd work because I don't speak the language. Um, but it was, you know, such an eye-opening experience that everybody in my family was shocked that I you know, was packing all my bags. So I, I flew back from the U.S. 
to then take a car and go to the northeast where nobody wants to go and so but it, it's really changed you know um it, it really changed my life uh you know this this path i, I think i would it would still go the same if i started again i don't know if i that's that yes thank you so much for for telling us about your your background that's a wonderful a wonderful story and great path to to where you are now it's it's so great that the the stars aligned to allow you to be working on an area that's at least somewhat close to home uh, I mean, it's very close to home because I, uh, um, so like in my current role right now, um, I'm on the NASA Harvest uh, team. I lead the Africa activities. Initially, we used to work only in East Southern Africa, but now we started doing some work in, in West Africa. I'm on the Severe Applied Sciences team. I'm the Agriculture Food Security thematic lead for the, for the current Applied Sciences team. And this is, you know, a really exciting space and place to be in because um, then, you know, I could combine my knowledge from home, um, my experiences working with people uh, in Eastern Africa, and then transferring it and, 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 and try and communicate, you know, between the, the science, the limitations, the challenges and the opportunities, you know, at, at different levels. So um, when I'm speaking with, um, you know, for example, people in my team, um, that, that we, have, we have a very strong, very supportive team, you know, they try and understand, you know, what the problem is and how we can solve it together. And then when, when I go back and, you know, work with uh, national agencies in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, I form, I form these very close relationships um, with the people that I work with. And um, it, it's, you know, it's very easy to support and understand what they need and then trying to bring the, the tools and technology to be able to address you know, some of the challenges that they're facing. So touching on that, what do you see as the, the kinds of threats that climate change is posing to agriculture? And what do you see as opportunities for remote sensing and other machine learning and helping agriculture adapt to, to climate change? Um, I mean, from my, from my firsthand experience, particularly when I was doing my, my research, um, I went to the Karamoja region many times. I went almost every year. I always went at the same time around August. I used to go during the summer. So when you go there in August, it just, it's a very different place. I'd never been there in January. Um, but through my other work, I went there in January. So when you're looking at remote sensing imagery or when you're looking at uh, indices that have been derived from this imagery, for example, the normalized difference vegetation index, you look at this time series and then you see, you know, below average, above average, average. It doesn't actually click until you see it, you know, um, when you're standing there in the field. And so when in January, and in January, everything is brown. It's almost as if you had a light, you could set the whole place on fire. Uh, when you go in August, everything is very green. Um, but it seems when you go in August, everything's very green. It seems like everybody should be okay. But, um, when you look at the practices, you know, the, the typical practices for, uh, for, for livelihood in, in, in the Karamoja region, they were primarily pastoralists and more and more they're becoming more and more dependent on agriculture. But the variability, just the climate variability within that region actually limits uh, agricultural production. So some crops that require consistent moisture cannot um, can, cannot do well enough that a farmer would get the best at the end of the season. And, you know, there's no, there's so much variability in space and in time that it just seems like, you know, farmers are just planting just to see what's going to happen this season, not because um, they're planting to, you know, to, to ensure that there's, you know, security for their livelihoods, but that's what they are actually doing. Um, and then you add the fact that, um, with climate change, this variability is becoming even more complicated. I mean, when you hear the, uh, the sorts of reports, um, they say, you know, this year's a drought year, this year's a drought year. So it's like consistent, you know, five years of drought. It's actually not, you know, by the definition of a drought, it isn't. A drought is not something that happens every, every year or every season. It's just that the variability and the expectations of, you know, the people that live or work on that land is, is so high, it's so extreme um, that it's impossible for them to sustain their livelihoods. And so, I mean, 
and that's you know that is when you're looking at drought but then when you look at um, um, increased rainfall for example in 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 the mountain regions and in the in east of the country um, there uh, constantly, you know, flash floods, constantly uh, landslides, but this is because, you know, there's this nexus too of land use, um, there's extension, you know, expansion of agriculture into the mountain. So I, I had the opportunity to actually go back to where I started my field work uh, last October. I went back to the Mount Melbourne region and it's changed so much. The boundary between the forest and the community is very clear, even when you're looking at satellite imagery, it's like very clear that it ends, the forest ends here, the people start here. But when I was there the last time, it wasn't like that. It was, you know, it was not very clear because the community wasn't actually, you know, going further and further up into the mountain. But um, this sustaining livelihoods in a very complex landscape and then add uh, climate change is just in incredibly challenging. So we have landslides, you know, claiming lives every year, but people continue to go further and further up into the mountain. So it's, it's, it's incredible. So, so tell us about how you, you see machine learning and remote sensing playing a role in benefiting the population in this region and other regions that you, that you work with. I think um, primarily for looking at agriculture, for me, the big, you know, the biggest contribution is to be able to provide information to a decision maker before we go to the individual farmer because individual farmers make their own decisions in Eastern Africa. There's, um, there's so much variability in what a person does that it's, it's almost impossible to control and understand and inform those, that decision making process. But um, the products coming out of remote sensing, machine learning, um, machine learning based remote sensing algorithms, uh, products, for example, if we're able to get uh, timely in season information about where crops are what crops are being grown and how those crops are doing is critical the reason is as a decision maker for example if i were a minister um, who was trying for example in the current situation to decide where um, where might we have surplus of food that we could bring somewhere where, or we could, you know, that we could all, you know, we could buy and store so that when people run out of food, we're able to supply that. Um, I would need to know where were, for example, I'm looking for a specific crop, where was maize grown? How did it perform last season? How much is available? This answering this question is, is so easy when farmers have some kind of direct reporting mechanism. Um, it's easier when you have large scale agriculture like in the US where you know, you know, there's so many hectares of wheat. You can use a data like from the Landsat system, which is the 30 meter resolution um, um, and be able to assess this whole area was uh, maize over this season maize performed this way. So farmers, you know, had way above average production. So there are all these methods that have been developed over a long term to be able to monitor those things. When it comes to smallholders, subsistence agriculture, these methods and that, that evolved. Um, you need, you know, there, there is critical urgency to provide this type of information. I want to know, so if you ask me, um, me, the minister, I'm saying, if you ask me, where do you think we might be able to get surplus of A? I would say, well, I don't know. I have to call somebody, right? But if there's a mechanism for automating and producing this information consistently, checking that it's valid, uh, collecting uh, other information that's relevant for making that information more consumable to uh, the general public. You know, sometimes the minister is trying to explain that, you know, there's a drought in place A, but because people are in place B where it's raining, they have no idea what the minister is communicating. And so remote sensing really provides that opportunity to look at large landscapes. So monitoring smallholder agriculture with this, so many small fields that are, so, you know, so disjointed, connected, mixed in so many different ways, I think remote sensing enables that. And it enables that from, a, a, you know, remotely. So I could do this from my office and uh, connect with the community, collect training data and all of those things. They push it, you know, they push it forward to me and then I make, uh, I make an analysis and then I can provide a, a clear information product to a minister and say, you know what, 90% of the country is experiencing severe drought. This is what the map looks like and you can validate that when we go to the field, but this is what it looks like. So 
providing that evidence base, I think, is really, really important, especially in times like right now when things change so much. Um, you know, in uh, in 2019, in Kenya, uh, for example, there was a delayed start of season due to cycle by die last year. When that delayed start happened, so if you're monitoring this with remote sensing, you know, you would have known a few weeks, you know, that the cyclone is, is going to hit, this is what's going to happen. And then that, un, you know, unraveled into crop failure in some parts of Kenya, right? Then that was followed by um, extreme rainfall due to the strong positive IOD, uh, 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 where there was just so much rainfall. And then by October, there was you know flooding and landslides. So being able to to monitor the whole country where all these different things are happening almost concurrently, and then being aware of what's happening outside of your borders, it's yeah, something that you absolutely. Can. So what? data are you using in these kinds of remote sensing models? What, it, what is the input to your, to your remote sensing? And so where do the, the labels long, come from too? So for the longer term, you know, for the longer term time series uh, analysis, how is now compared to the last so many years, one of the most uh, used uh, data sets is from MODIS. MODIS is a moderate resolution spectral radiometer. It's a, a 250 meter resolution. Uh, um, it gives us a 250 meter resolution product and it, 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 there are 500 meter resolution versions of it. But that you can use to look at anywhere in the world um, and compare it to the last 20 years. Okay. What that helps you understand is if things were really bad in 2009, how is it right now compared to 2009? Got it. Um, um, there are also, there's Landsat data, which is 30 meter resolution um, that has some limitations, but when combined with um, Sentinel-2 data coming out of the European Space Agency, there's a new product that's been developed, um, uh, which is HLS, which is a harmonized Landsat Sentinel-2 product, which enables almost, you know, an image every three days, uh, combining these two things together. Mm -hmm. One of the game changers, I think, for smallholder agriculture really for sure has been the Sentinel-2 data, which is global coverage. It's a 10 meter resolution and, you know, we're exploring how we can use um, those data for developing um, cropland crop type maps. Uh, like more recently in this uh, data challenge uh, with a collaborator, um, uh, Hannah, who is in our group, she's uh, um, machine learning lead. Uh, we're able to use, you know, Sentinel-2 data using uh, labels from a partner, um, plant village, uh, and we're able to, you know, produce, you know, crop type, uh, sort of a, a preliminary crop type, you know, crop type product right. that then you could roll out. But, you know, one of the challenges, and, we, you know, we've been speaking about this constantly over the last couple of weeks, and it's, it came up even yesterday in the virtual booth, is, you know, just availability of data, training data. So we need, if you want to do in-season crop types, you want to be able to um, collect training data in season for that particular season. Like I said, the farmers yes. change their decision. Every, it could plant this field today, not plant it tomorrow, not plant it the next season. Um, they could weed one, not weed the other. They could mix one and not mix, you know, they mix it this year, not mix it next year. So you need some kind of, uh, you need a training data set that then you could use to train your machine learning algorithms to come up with in season. You so you're know. saying that it's not even necessarily transferable completely one season to the next, to the kinds of insights that you get. You'd like to be able to, to transfer, to, to, to be training your models right then to make sure that they're maximally applicable. Is that? I, I think absolutely, absolutely you, need, you need to be able, uh, it, it's, it's, it also goes back to the decisions the farmers are making. Sure. You need to be able to, you need to be able to factor those in. And this, this decision is so many over a small landscape. You could find that, you know, one, one field, one, what's considered one field in the US is owned by 10 farmers who do completely different things. Sure. So in order to learn that for a smaller area and then apply it for a broader area, um, it's very, very challenging. I so, so, you, so, you, so you could bring the method but then you need to train it locally. Sure. Yeah. The, the kinds of insights that you're getting are not necessarily going to be broadly applicable across uh, a country or a, even a region, it seems. 
Yeah, I mean, yesterday we were, we were speaking about this, some work that we're doing in Mali, and uh, there are these huge trees in the fields, huge trees. And when, you, when, you, when, you're, when you're looking at, if you're interested in figuring out how the maize is doing, and then your signal, you know, when you look, if you're looking at NDVI, NDVI will be through the roof because it's a huge tree. But then masking out that tree for Mali, it might not be necessary in parts of Kenya. Of course. Um, and then you go uh, here in Uganda. It's, I mean, the average field closer to the city is like my, my I, have a, I have a sort of a, a bin outside the house where I'm growing everything in it. You find there's a mango tree, bananas, cassava. Uh, someone has a, mm -hmm. um, beans and peanuts and uh, a pineapple in the same exact field. So how do you account that to be able to provide a useful, you know, a useful product, you know, like how, how do you, how do you do that? With it really, it really you... reminds you that every situation is different and the kind of, the kind of agriculture setting that I know I imagine having grown up in the, in the US is going to be very different potentially from what people are, are doing in, in, in different places. There are so many different ways to do agriculture. <laughs> Uh, not just at different at different scales of stakeholders, but also just literally what it looks like from the air. From so, the air. Yeah. So what what stakeholders are you working with? You're obviously working with with um, the governments uh, in Uganda, Kenya, um, and Tanzania, mm -hmm. and I yeah, think yeah. Mali as well. Um, you said mm -hmm. so. You are you working with these government? Uh, uh, officials to try to create these insights and then um, carry them forward in in terms of guarding against famine. And by the way, I should mention, um, audience, please ask questions. We will be turning over to audience questions in just a few minutes. So please ask questions either in the Zoom chat or if you're following on Rocket Chat as a part of the iClear conference, feel free to ask questions there as well. So, um... So stakeholders. So in, in Tanzania, uh, where I started to you know really do field work and learn about agriculture monitoring, apply whatever that I'd learned um, with st in a stakeholder setup. Not when I was just doing my research, you know, doing figuring out how do you collect data in a how do you, you know figure out logistics. So. We work with the university, so Kwena University of Agriculture. They um, they're a you know really good research university and you know to do a lot of field experimentation so with them we had a lot of fun you know flying drones and um walking around everywhere in tanzania collecting training data for developing you know uh, crop uh, cropland maps uh we worked with primarily the national food security division they're basically in charge of reporting about food availability food access um you know prices and all of these things so they, um, I mean, they're, I call them my champions. So we have like this team of 11 people that I primarily work with, uh, train them on how to use, for example, the GLAM system, which is global culture monitoring. It's a, a, um, a satellite data archiving system that makes it easy and quick for, you know, someone to analyze uh, data. So we're moving, actually we're moving that into the cloud so that it becomes a lot you know, quicker to, to access the data and then make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, train them on using things like the early warning explorer where they can use rainfall and temperature data they can get um, you know make their own analysis about what the average long term looks like you'd think that they'd have access to this information but they don't um, because there are so many connections between different partners or, or agencies within the government that are not directly connected and there you know there aren't things like for example you can go to the NOAA website click a download so there isn't an, an equivalent of NOAA in Tanzania where you can just go click and download. Uh, typically, they would send you information in a PDF report. So if I'm making an assessment from the Ministry of Agriculture, it's not very useful. Um, so in Uganda, we work with the Office of the Prime Minister, the Ministry of Agriculture as well. Um, in Kenya, uh, the State Department for Crop, Res for crop, development, crop Resources and Development uh, is a uh, uh, primary partner in Mali. Uh, there's a commission for food security uh, that I primarily have only trained them exactly once. We're supposed to do this again. <laughs> but it was supposed to happen like this. Literally, I think 
two weeks ago. No, it's supposed to begin in May in preparation for the upcoming season. Uh, work with extension agents in all of these countries. In Tanzania, I uh, work with a group of extension agents from Morogoro. These are primarily for helping me collect field data, collect um, information that's useful for the ministry to characterize and explain what they're seeing in the satellite data. Um, in uh, in Rwanda as well, we're working with the Ministry of Agriculture. In Rwanda, we sort of set up this, we call it like a working group where it involves the uh, mid-agency, uh, uh, the Rwanda Agricultural Research Board. And this is actually really a, a really good setup because these expertise across the different agencies uh, sort of come together in order for them to communicate what's going on. Um, also work with regional agencies, the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development. It's based out in Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, EGAD, Climate Predictions and Applications Center. EGAD is a Greater Horn, Greater Horn, I don't remember what it stands for exactly, but it's like this big, you know, the Greater Horn of Africa, like the big uh -huh. horn. Yeah. So all the countries that fall in that horn, uh -huh. uh, is the, they're part of, of EGAD. And um, we helped set up this uh, regional crop monitor, which is basically you have representatives from each of the member countries participating and uh, making assessments and analysis using remote sensing information for their own reporting. And then also the East Africa Grain Council. So there are many, 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 many um, partners. Uh, and I think for, for me, largely, I've learned a lot from them that has helped me, you know, better approach like some of the work that we're doing, simply because then I, I, I better understand, you know, what the needs are and what the gaps are through those relationships. Fantastic. Thank you for, for describing how, like, what the, what the pipeline is for you for having this, this kind of wonderful impact. Suppose someone with a machine learning background wants to get into this space. What would you recommend doing? What advice would you give? And what, what common pitfalls maybe have you seen in this, in this kind of work that people should be aware of? I would say I think um, one of the primary things would be to try and understand remote sensing as remote sensing, you know, the science and uh, what you're actually seeing when you see it. So I like to visualize my outputs. Uh, and when I look, for example, I've, I've been trying to do this land cover classification and um, I've been trying to just, you know, do like random forests. And every time it comes out, I go and look at it. And, you know, I'm trying to look to figure out why isn't this class coming out how I'm expecting it to. I would For say that- For those aren't in machine learning, random forest is a technique in machine learning. It doesn't just refer to random forests that you might see in satellite <laughs> imagery, just side note. Yeah, sorry, note, yes. <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. Um, I would say that I think, I mean, for sure that understanding the remote sensing sciences would be a really good benefit. The other one, for sure, um, you know, if you're, you know, you have a strong computer science background, but um, haven't, uh, haven't worked in the field. So if you're trying to look at crops, you need to go, um, you need to go to the field and actually experience what you're looking at. So uh, when you walk around with a GPS and collect a bunch of training data, collect a bunch of training data, um, you would, you know, you, once you get it, you train your model and then you look at your output. You're like, well, when I was standing in the field, it didn't look like that. So I, I would say for, for the biggest benefit is to be in the environment that you're trying to study. So when you when you run your algorithm, try to think about it when you're in that actress space, I would say it would be, you know. But there's just so much to do. There's so many questions to answer with remote sensing. <laughs> so many questions. You know, if I had all the resources in the world, I would just like, uh, we'd have like, like one billion people each working on a different problem, but then making those problems answer a bigger question, I think is just what remote sensing can enable us to do. We have this group in uh, at Maryland GLAD, uh, Global Land uh, Monitoring. They produce this uh, Global Forest Watch product and each one in this group works on a very specific thing, you know, and 
when you hear the, you know, the PI, Matt Hansen, talk about how all of these things fit together, you know, it makes it, it makes it so interesting. It would make anybody want to do, you know, forests, <laughs> even though I would just, you know, love to do forests because just being out in the forest, you know, the real forest is just a fantastic experience. We'll have two sessions on forests later today for those who want to, who want to be working on those kinds of forests as well as the random forests. Uh, so a question from the audience. Uh, how important is it to involve women farmers in the data gathering and interpretation process? This is a really good question. We just spoke about this uh, a week ago. Um, so in my data gathering, I mean, it's been very opportunistic because working with like groups of already established extension agents, uh, a lot of the time it's, you know, like 80% men. I have these pictures from fieldwork and if you count the heads, you would see it's like maybe 80, 85% uh, men. Um, but I've met some incredible uh, women. There's a lady we found in, 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 uh, in, in Morogoro, no, no, not Morogoro, in Jombe. I have a picture of her pointing at uh, my computer screen, looking at a satellite image, telling us what field to go to, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> It was just so amazing. I, I still, I think it's my favorite. I, I, it's my favorite uh, field photograph ever. And uh, her friend is standing, leaning over her, carrying a baby. But they had so much insight that they were like, well, we can go here and here and here. And then they walked us there. And, you know, they were like, this field, this is maize. This looks like some so-and-so's house. Um, so I would say, I mean, the thing that we were talking about specifically was to figure out a way of involving more women in, in the data collection, mm -hmm. especially to Im not only improve the, di the, the dynamics, but also the fact that um, more women work the land than men. So they know more about yeah. what is actually happening. Um, and it is absolutely, it, it is absolutely important for sure. And it's something that I think more and more, uh, like when we're trying to do our work in Mali, I said to the uh, our collaborators that, I, you know, I think you should get 50% men, 50% women. And they're like, you're going to have a problem because of ABCD. And I was like, let's just try it. Like, <laughs> you know, a problem because of ABCD. But um, I think it's just, you know, pushing uh, because you will definitely find these, uh, these women that can be trained pretty easily and collect data and then be able to provide you insights. So we added things like, you know, sending a voice message to explain what's happening in the field if they can't type it, for example, and then adding pictures. Wonderful. So the forms uh, have pictures rather than words. They don't have to read, they can select. Uh -huh. And then um, translating the forms into as many languages as possible. The one in Mali is in Bambara. I can't read a word of Bambara, but um, it was really important for the agents to be able of to course. see the form in the language that they understand. Yeah, absolutely. So, Another question from the audience. I'm wondering how much immediate help fancy tech solutions actually offer. Is there a, reason, a risk that the ML community has wrong assumptions about practicability, like overestimates for funding stuff like drones, and is over-engineering things? Should the focus be on very simple solutions instead? Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. That project that I told you where we were flying drones, it was so much fun for us for the field work, but the drones didn't actually provide any output that was relevant or not, I mean, not relevant, but that was specifically useful for who our end user was. So, um, I mean, also over promising as to what the product can deliver and for who, um, I think it's very important to define who the user is. So a, a crop type classification map, I don't think is important for the farmer. It is important for you know a, a donor agency, a ministry who's trying to figure out where to move supplies from to where. Um, but saying that you know this product is going to improve productivity for the farmer, I think it's you know people need to. I, I think people have to be honest about what that exactly means. How is it? You know the other thing is. Um, informing agronomic practices so what if i said well this field doesn't have you know needs a little bit more pesticide what does that have to do with whether or not the farmer can actually access you know what is you know, the pesticide or the input or whatever it is the solution that you know the whatever the you know so you you generate your map and you say well there are not enough nutrients in this particular field the farmer could do a b c d but the farmer doesn't have the resources to actually buy those inputs so you're actually not helping the farmer, but you know, when you're writing your nice report, you say that you reached you know, 100,000 100, farmers 
and told all of them they need to get A and B and C, but it actually didn't solve the problem. So I think, I think for me, there's still a very critical gap in terms of how we can actually really inform a smallholder farmer who is not, you know, who doesn't have soil moisture sensors and a, a computer screen to monitor all of these things or get um, updated SMSs about the forecast and what it means. Um, there's still, I think there's still a, a, a critical gap. Another question. Um, you briefly mentioned issues with downscaling models. Have you worked with the, issue, the scenarios of upscaling? And if so, in which instances, topics, questions, they perform well? So generalization, uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier. How much do you, do you feel like insights generalize when you upscale? So uh, when we use the MODIS data and you know, not models or anything like that when you're using the NDVI, we are definitely upscaling. I mean, we're, we're looking at course resolution uh, data. We have in a pixel, you can have like, I don't know how many farmers sometimes um, in a MODIS pixel. So we are generalizing. So when we talk about like, if anybody told you right now about you know general crop conditions and telling and comparing it with the last five years or last year last four years except if they're looking at time series from sentinel 2 which is 10 meter resolution a lot of the time they're looking at modest resolution so this is you know generalizing so you say crops over this whole area are above average but in fact when you go and look what you're calling crops over this area above average could all be agroforestry and primarily all the pixels you know 90 percent of the pixel is a giant tree with the crops under the tree not performing well so uh -huh. there's a lot of when it comes to the conditions assessment we're generalizing a lot and this is where you know the other thing about providing this accurate crop type you know, cultivated area maps will become really important for when we're using those, the, the general. So if you have, you know, a good crop type map or cropland map, you know, a current cropland map, then you can use the information coming out of the modest time series in an informed way. So you can like, exclude all the pixels that in your cropland map are not crops and then just focus in on the ones that are crops. And I think this, you know, that that's where we want to go. Like, be able to provide this as soon as possible, accurate info, as accurate as possible, but to help that generalizing. Because we, we are using the general models, we're using MODIS for talking about crop conditions, but the basis of it is these cropland maps that are outdated, you know, from 2015, one of the ones that I just thought about is from 2015 a uh, product from 2015 about cropland I too especially could also be because of the resolution it was developed at you know could be like a 30 meter product or 250 meter product for areas where you have very small fields so it doesn't actually work really well got it thank you um i have uh, another question uh, from anarud um, how do you take up the mixed cropping challenge in a coarser mm -hmm. resolution? I don't think you can take that challenge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we spoke about this. Uh, there's uh, someone was saying that, you know, the model performs well for uh, pure stands. So pure stands of maize, the model performs well. But then disaggregating between the mixes, then uh, this is talking about like 10 meter resolution. Uh, but even a 10 meter resolution, the mixes become a very big problem, except if you lump them together. So if you say all of these fields are mixed, for example, but you cannot say that separate out uh, beans, maize, uh, peanuts, uh -huh. maize, you know, it's, this is a very big challenge. I think this requires a, a real machine learning expert to answer after they've actually gone through <laughs> the data and found, you know, um, big problems with it. Uh, no, absolutely, that makes sense. Um, question from Owen Vanea. Um, you explained well how your methods can inform food security for public officers and policy, but could you also elaborate a bit more how your work empowers farmers directly? So, uh, I mean, I say a primary entry point or the, the primary end user is uh, decision maker because of the scale of the product and and what information is in the product but um, that said however when 
the product is designed specifically for a purpose that uh, supports a pharma, then it is directly impacting a pharma. For example, the Kenya uh, crop insurance program, um, one of the requirements for doing assessments for yield, which is a requirement for determining who gets paid and who doesn't get paid, um, is having you know detailed information about where crops are, how the crops performed, and remote sensing can actually help with this. Another one, another example in um, going back to the generalized models, when I was doing my field work in 2015 in, in Uganda, I'd come back for the first time, for the first time to meet with the office of the prime minister. And when I arrived, I brought, you know, my, I was so excited about my field work. I'd gone with a big camera, I had videos, pictures, all sorts of things. And then of course the usual, so I typically, I used to write like a report of my field work. So I'd written a summary report. This is what the satellite data says. This is what I found in the field. You know, it's clearly, there's a big problem. The season is really, really bad. You know, there's already extensive crop failure. And when I presented that, um, he said to me, this is what we've been looking for evidence, you know, to justify why we need to act immediately. So they used my report, presented it to uh, the prime minister uh, on, on Thursday. And then on Saturday, that office released the first trucks of food aid to go and uh, wow. bring food aid to the Karamoja region. Yeah. And I was able to document all of oh this because gosh. I have, I have these videos. The most important piece of information I, just, I should say is not the remote sensing, it's the videos. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> the videos clearly showed, you know, i taken taken them across, I think, four districts, you know, like this is what I found in A, B, C, D, all of these photos of this season. This is what this farmer explained, you know, it started raining, it stopped completely, it hasn't rained since, and it's already August, so I'm not going to get anything out of this. And then you show that, you know, in the remote sensing map and just show clearly in the last 10 years, right now is the worst. And so they were like, well, there's no disagreement here. We're going to do something. And then coming out of that, they uh, designed the disaster risk financing uh, program, which uses the uh, MODIS data for determining when there might be a problem. And as soon as, you know, it comes so close to the threshold that this is what a very bad year looks like. And this year's come so close to it. We need to prepare so that we can disperse funds so that people can do other things rather than work on their field. Um, so they, you know, instead of working on their agriculture fields, the farmers end up working on like road construction or planting trees, stuff like that. Uh -huh. And that actually helps, you know, it helps, it really, really helps um, in order to keep people from falling into, you know, uh, malnutrition, which is a very big problem in, in the northeast of the country. Um, yeah, so there's been, you know, and, and uh, when I go back uh, and uh, I see like, you know, people that I do field work with, they're so happy. First of all, because we have so much fun when we're doing field work. You know, we get stuck together in the mud, or the river, <laughs> whatever those types of things. Um, but then, you know, we talk about, you know, about this program, well, this work that we're doing feeds into that program, you know, and they get really excited, like, oh my God, yeah, I worked on a road the other season. It was just fantastic. Of course, there's always a translator because, you know, like, in Karamoja, uh -huh. they speak in Karamojong, and it's not related at all to the to my native language. So, uh, but it's really interesting, you know, to see that. Um, and I'd like to have, you know, experience more of that and really, you know, see this, you know, positive impact on 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 on, on the farmers. But there's so few programs like that, and a lot of them are on trial basis or have limited resources, or they provide very little res, you know, very little support for the farmers for a short time period so they're not you know they're not consistent well but I there's think that, definitely a lot of potential yeah. i think that we are out of time i could continue talking i would love to talk with you like this for the rest of the the rest of the day thank you so much for for joining us um thank you audience for those fantastic questions sorry we didn't have time to to ask more. I think there is a clap button. Um, so, so I think the audience can actually clap. Um, thank you so much, Professor Catherine Nakalembe, for joining us today. Um, we're going to just take a, a, a moment to transition, and then we are going to move over to um, the next session, which is a, an introduction to climate change. 
especially for those with a machine learning background. But yes, thank you again for joining. I was going to say one, yes, one, more, one thing. more thing. One, yes, more, one more thing. I mean, from uh, just wanted to say that we are, I am actually looking for a postdoc, someone with a machine mm. learning background who is interested in any of the stuff that I said. Uh, uh, the announcement will come out pretty soon, but um, we are looking for uh, someone who we can work with, I think. And how should people, how should people get in touch if they're- I mean, they could, um, my email, I don't know, I can type it in the chat box. Uh, if I can never find it, it disappeared, there it is. Uh, no, that's wrong, sorry. Oh, no, it came out. No, or, that was wrong. That's, that's, wrong. that's wrong, okay. Yes, that's the correct one. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I hope that I hope that um, you um, all in the audience um, who are potentially in a position to postdoc um, consider working on these really fantastic projects. Thank you so much for for joining us again, um, and we'll get started in just a moment with the climate change one hundred and one.